My name is Nick. Uh, I made a website today for my presentation. So if any of you are checking out your computers right now, uh, check out ng-cores.com. And I'm going to talk about building an app with AngularJS and how to connect that with the back end with cores. So your front end and your back end to be completely separated and yet it's still talking about. Um, so first, a little bit about why. Um, as web developers, we've kind of seen what the norm of good website design has been uh, and how it's evolved over the years. Uh, about 10 years ago, we were all logging into AOL, and this is what websites were. Uh, and these norms have kind of set a floor of um, what is an acceptable website you can create on the internet. But with Angular, uh, you can go above and beyond that. Um, you can do something with uh, with the type of fluidity as a native application. Um, so basically, I use AngularJS because I want to raise the bar on my front end design. And even though that there are multiple factors that go into making a successful website, such as what information, what value do you bring your users, aesthetics is definitely something that's pretty important and definitely something that I've done a lot of effort into making happen. So, uh, the kind of framework for the talk today is going to be about views, scopes, and servers. Um, the explanation on the AngularJS site, yes? So you, uh, the words are cutting off on that. Mm -hmm. On the left, the left, the left side there, you just need to move that <coughs> over a tag or something. Yeah. Sorry. You can just move the browser. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Just move the window. All right. Thank you. There you go. Yeah. Thank you. That's well, not what Max <laughs> Don't, don't maximize it. Yeah, yeah. Other side. Yeah, yeah. Other side. There you go. Thank you. So. Yeah. So there's some resolution issue, I guess. Okay. So uh, with your view, this is kind of like your HTML and your CSS and stuff that's going to interact with uh, scope, which we're going to talk about in a little bit. Um, in English, I guess there are things called interactives <coughs> that can uh, display or show certain animations and whatnot. Uh, given uh, what scope you pass into the view. Uh, next, there is the scope itself, which in Angular is known as the view model. Uh, this is really similar to a Rails example, which I highlighted here. Um, in Rails, we typically send instance variables to views uh, based on controller actions. So here is a index action where if in the Rails app would be requested, we're going to get a list of all the users' usernames. Uh, so scope pretty much works the same way. Uh, it gives our view a data source that we can uh, perform some logic with and display certain parts of our website. And finally is the server part, uh, which is how do apps uh, talk to one another. Um, I'm going to show an example of the HTTP uh, service on AngularJS and uh, how to fetch a quick little resource from a Rails API and how to do it even though the two things are close to completely different websites. So scope, uh, like I explained earlier, is kind of like your instance variable in views. Um, you can initialize it. Uh, so in my controller, uh, let's say I have this awesome group, which is actually Las Vegas Review Group from that John Doe. I have not updated that. Uh, and then uh, you take that initialized value and you can display it by using these uh, double bracket signs. So uh, basically, if I just printed this, uh, this is basically created by um, the printing of that awesome group. You can see here that we have an ng scope and ng binding, which means that scope will automatically bind this value there and will update it as uh, soon as it detects change. There's all this for you out of the box, which is cool. So the prototypical uh, first AngularJS application is doing like a hello world where you can just say, like, hello, Russ or hello Judd, or hello Jason, or hello Nick, and uh, you can dynamically change uh, what's going on um, based on what the scope is. So for here, uh, click down here, I have uh, the scope Nick, which is just a regex. Uh, it's been updated to include a carrot and a color sign, so it just matches the Nick and not like that. You know. And uh, in JavaScript, there's this method called test which is just like a equal tilde in Ruby, where basically you're seeing if a string matches a regex. And 
uh, there's this binding directory called ng-get. Uh, so I say, if it's not nig, just print out fellow person. Otherwise, if it is nig, print out this message called study for the bar, and we'll uppercase scope. <coughs> we'll do some little bit. So that's pretty much how scope works. You can initialize it. Uh, it'll automatically detect changes. And uh, if you can set it up to where you automatically push updates to the scope um, without the user even having to touch anything. So it's pretty cool stuff. What does ng stand for? ng stands for Angular. It's just ng, ng, so the ng. That's the only reason why they chose that uh, abbreviation. There's no um, symbolism or anything else besides that. Okay. So uh, next for directives, um, you can do a lot of things <coughs> with it. Uh, the directive that gets shipped with AngularJS is called ng repeat. Um, and basically it's uh, something that iterates over an array of stuff. Uh, so once again, I compare the contrast to real controller versus uh, an Angular uh, ng repeat directive. Um, here in our controller, we have our product, and then we're just iterating through the product, so putting up uh, the product name and the paragraph tag. Uh, with Angular, we can have um, our products uh, in an array. Um, Angular works with JSON objects, so make sure uh, that your resources are JSON. Uh, and then the scope, we just say ng repeat product and products. It's the same thing as iterating over an array, and we can use our scope bindings to print out the name and the description uh, in the HTML. So uh, one another example of a directive is this highlight JS directive that I'm using. Um, it's using something called transclusion, uh, which means if I put this div hljs, uh, notice that ng repeat and hljs aren't like prototypical HTML5 tags, or just something that Angular adds to it. Uh, with here, uh, with this directive, the HLJS directive, if I add code in here, um, this will basically uh, get interpreted by the directive HLJS, and that allows me to do the code step in TC here. So, uh, the next thing is filters. Um, I did do a quick little website where we had to display like a list of beers for this nonprofit. Uh, so um, it's actually this Bruce Best. Uh, I did this with started with this at Brian and Dylan at Hackathon. And it's basically just a list of beers and I wanted to organize it alphabetically and capitalize the letters. So I would use filters for that. Uh, Angular comes with a few built-in filters. Uh, first is just the limit filter. Um, as you can see, this site is not built for smaller spaces. This is code like that. Uh, but the limit basically is just like calling the limit in uh, Ruby. Um, I'm only just, um, coming back with 10 results here. Finally, we can order by beer. Um, this beer is an array of a hash that has a key of beer and brewery and uh, alcohol content. So we want to sort by beer, and that automatically does this alphabetically uh, based on the beer um, key. Uh, and then I could also lowercase everything, and you can see how I'm chaining the methods, even though I can't really see it that well. Uh, we can do the ng repeat, we can order by beer, we can limit to 10, and we can lowercase it. It's in there, right? You promise? The promise is in there. If you make it full screen in your computer, you can see it. Uh, yes, it's right here. Uh, the lowercase is right there, and basically it takes um, what's ever in that scope binding and lowercases everything. So, building the custom directive, uh, basically I just want to put capitalize here instead of lowercase to capitalize the first thing of every word. I found this on Stack Overflow, um, basically just uh, your input and your scope, and then you just do a little regex to uh, uppercase the um, first character of a word, and then lowercase the rest. Uh, next, let's talk about routing. Um, I use UI router, it's an alternative to ng router, and basically you treat your entire application as state. Uh, so if you say this state is active and this state is active, you know, render this template. And it's really helpful when it comes to nested views uh, and also doing like, um, I guess how some websites have like anchor tags, you can actually make them full URL tags, which is pretty cool. So uh, I'm using Yeoman, I'm going to talk about it in the next section. Uh, if you install Angular UI Router, um, you just uh, 
Excel with Bower. Uh, Bower is the way to download the JavaScript libraries. Um, that and Node package uh, module are akin to gems in Ruby. So after we installed, we just require it uh, in our application JS, this UI.router. Uh, we require all of our packages uh, when we first declare our app. So this is our namespace to our app, and these are various packages at UA router, at the foundation package, etc. And then uh, we pass in the state provider, URL and the URL router provider. This first line here says that when we're at a resource that is not de specifically defined uh, within the application, uh, to just route to the root. So if I want to change this to you know whatever, it's going to take me automatically back to root. And uh, with these various states, I have a root state, a Y state, and you know pretty much everything you see up here. I choose the template uh, URL and then the controller, which will provide that view with the necessary scope. And all that is done for you as soon as the routes change. And yeah, it's pretty cool. And then with a state provider, um, you can inject it into the root scope. Uh, the root scope basically is the scope for the entire application that isn't defined by a controller. And uh, with that, uh, you can basically do like active-based navigation. So here, uh, I'm basically calling this includes. Um, so basically, does the current state, does that include you know, root or Y or vscope server? And that is what gives me these uh, active highlightings on the navbar up top. So pretty simple, don't have to do much. Uh, by including state in the root scope, I automatically can detect what current scope I'm in. And then instead of doing uh, hypertext references or the href in uh, link tags, I can just call state reference. So um, I don't have to worry about necessarily saying this is this route, this route. Uh, I can just declare state, kind of similar to how path helpers work in Rails. So like I said earlier, uh, it's pretty easy to nest routes uh, in uh, UI router. Uh, all you have to do is when you declare a child uh, state to a parent state, use that notation right here. Um, I'm going to show this in a little bit when we go over the course slide of how it works, but this is all you need to do to set it up, so it's pretty cool. And finally, uh, on the topic of routing, I like to talk about the HTML5 history API. Um, normally with like uh, Angular apps, there's like this type of routing going on where you have the hash tag and then all that other stuff, but that's kind of dangerous if you are um, trying to upgrade like, a legacy uh, or older uh, application that already has um, links that are shared all across the internet. So integrating the HTML5 history API is kind of vital. So everything is a single page application, but um, we get the routing as if it wasn't a single page application. Uh, keep in mind that uh, here's a list of browsers um, <coughs> that support it. Uh, it does not work for IE9 and below, um, but that shouldn't be an issue these days. Uh, my dad works for a government contractor, and even they are on IE10, so um, yeah, I figure you might as well be able to use it. So to set it up, uh, we insert it into this application at JS, and you can use the code on GitHub, um, but we would include in our, when we're decoding <coughs> application, that we want to turn on the HTML5 true, and this hash prefix only refers to how Angular will cope with browsers that don't support HTML5. So in which case, if someone's trying to access the website through IE9, uh, they'll see that hash bang dash, et cetera. And then here is one way to uh, serve up uh, files using Node.js. Um, reason, without setting something like this up, uh, when you go to the routing, you won't be able to load anything um, because it'll just see that state you have to load the index to. Uh, hopefully this makes sense. You have to load the index.html as well as loading any of these states. Otherwise, if we just link to here, it'll 404 and you won't know what's going on. Um, so yeah, I found this on a pull request, but I ended up uh, finding out a way to serve all this with Sinatra, which is pretty cool. Okay. So next is Yeoman. Uh, don't have much to show here because it's pretty well documented. Um, if you go to uh, Angular Generator, Pretty simple setup. Um, 
uh, you have to install Node, uh, and then you have these uh, kind of generators that will help you uh, spin up stuff. So I can show what it kind of looks like. So so here is uh, my application on GitHub, and this is everything that Yeoman created for me, except for the Ruby files, which is some Sinatra stuff I added in it uh, to make sure it works with the history HTML5 API. Um, so I get an app folder, I get a distribution folder. Uh, the difference, the app folder has like um, where I do my development and whatnot. And the distribution is where everything gets minified and amplified and compiled for production. So you see here, basically, I just have one giant minified JavaScript file, which is pretty cool. Um, so when you look into it, there's a few caveats that took me a while to figure out to get started. Um, first is uh, knowing the bower.json and the package.json files. So bower, like I said earlier, is just for the library. So third-party um, JavaScript files and whatnot, stuff that in the Rails app you put in the vendors folder, uh, this is what goes in Bower. And when you're updating a version of your app for production, make sure to bump this version number up, because that will change, uh, but the distribution, um, it'll change like these uh, shot keys or whatever. So that's the bower.json. Next is the node package manager. And this is where you do everything in grunt. Uh, grunt runs your test, uh, it runs your server, it comes packaged with fiber load. And the configuration for grunt lies within this grunt file.js file on uh, your application root. Um, you can configure it to uh, do all types of stuff. Um, the library load stuff is really fast. Uh, it runs your tests automatically. Um, if any of you checked out Alex's Rails 4 application, it kind of works just like the form and start. Um, and yeah, that's pretty much it. Uh, the reason why you want to run the Yeoman generators instead of um, <coughs> just adding files to your project is that the Yeoman generators will actually require uh, the various JavaScript files you create right here. Uh, so here's a list of files that uh, I guess we need. And uh, it'll create the file for you, the test for you, and insert the script tag right here. But in production, this and this all just become a call to one giant minified JavaScript file. So that's pretty cool. That's all I work for you. Uh, finally, uh, do not use Yo Angular routes if you're using UI router uh, because it'll just mess with stuff that you have to go back and the fix. Uh, but if you're going to use UI router, just use the Yo Angular controller uh, generator and treat everything else you need. So finally, let's talk about course. Course is cross origin resource sharing. So uh, I have a um, server on ng cores-api.rokuapp.com, so completely separated from my front end. And I think Cores is really cool because you can have one back end power multiple front ends, uh, so you can spin up multiple versions of your website, or why you can use the same back end of Cores implementation to service mobile applications and that type of stuff. So uh, going back, I'll talk a little bit about nested routes, so let's go ahead and see what a nested route looks like. I can see the Rails code, so here's this API I built. It's probably one of the smallest Rails APIs you can build. The only thing I did was create a uh, secret controller, and then I had this index action, which if you type in a secret password, uh, you'll get a response, and otherwise you'll get a 403. So uh, I'm going to... So I'm going to make a post to my ng-cores.api, and I'm going to pass in the scope password. And if I get a 403, I'm going to log it, uh, and also I'm going to log failed. And if I get a success, I'm going to log it and also uh, see what the response says. So let's try it out. So the password is open sesame, but let's say I try blah. 
uh, what's forbidden. So I got that from a completely different API, uh, sorry, a completely different, um, I guess, yeah, a completely different API. It's this ng uh, four API, and it's giving my 403. Uh, but if I do the open sesame, yay, now I got my 200 acceptance. So, in order to do this on the real side, uh, it's really simple. There's this gem called Rack Force, and it pretty much does everything you need to do. Uh, this is pretty much all I've added. Um, note that I'm using a Rails API, and if you're using full out Rails, you have to order your middleware in a certain way. <coughs> uh, but basically, I'm allowing uh, both my local host and this ng cores that throw wrap to make requests to my server and then it's just like uh, you're making requests from view to controller inside your rails app after you have it set up so I could spin off my uh, my front end it could be on a completely different server I can maybe like focus on DigitalOcean versus hosting on Heroku and it'll still work because core is allowed it to work by saying okay this is an approved domain um, let's go ahead and let them access resources. Uh, if you try to make um, calls to external websites uh, without this course implementation, uh, you're going to see this error in your console, um, and especially this no access allowed origin. Um, and uh, yeah, these are just WP specifications that you need to abide by if you want um, one a front end website to talk to a completely different server. Okay. So finally, um, deploying to Heroku. Uh, so I basically just copied this guy's uh, Sinatra implementation and made a few tweaks. But uh, it's pretty simple. Uh, with Heroku, they look for a proc file and a config.ru file. Um, I'm just saying. Uh, Start my unicorns. Unicorns are starting um, starting the server, and the server is just right here. Uh, notice how I'm sending the index.html file with no matter what request you get, so the HTML5 history API works. And yeah, that's pretty much it. Um, so any questions? Yeah. Do you have to do something special in the front end to make the cores work? No. It's a server side implementation. <laughs> you never trust what you, the users do. So. so, if you use Ember, I know you can just drop that straight into a Rails app. There's like an Ember generator. Is there something like that for Angular? No, and frankly, with cores, I think that's not the most optimal approach. Um, I really like having my front end and back end completely separated. Uh, for the reasons that you can do multiple versions of your website. Um, like, for instance, startups preach A and B testing. Well, if half your users like one version and the other half like the other version, you might as well have both versions of the website to deploy. Then don't you have to buy two servers? Pick two servers. Well, you can use the record, which is free, and still you can make money to pay for a server. Sure. Yeah. <coughs> yeah. Um, what benefits does like Angular resource have over using like the built-in core functionality? So Angular resource just is basically a shortcut to doing RESTful routing. Um, I just use HTTP, uh, but you can use ng resource if you want. It's now a completely separate module from the main library, so you're going to have to include that if you want to use it. Um, you did this up as a Angular Rails app, yeah. Since it's static, don't you just want to bring that through? Yeah. Well, one thing that I haven't figured out, I gave it a shot, but I didn't figure it out in time, is there's a way to take all of your HTML and turn that into a minified JavaScript with Grunt. Uh, so as part of the Grunt build process, we'll create a giant minified JavaScript file with as many HTML templates. So once I have that figured out, figured out, I'm just going to store everything up to the end. So user requests a new feature, a modification of feature. Do you think this is going to slow you down at all, or much at all? Delivering stuff? No, because I think it'll actually speed it up. Because uh, typically when I find when you're working with 
uh, not tech savvy people, the front end is all they care about. So I can mock it, have my meeting with them, and then actually build up the back end implementation. I guess I was thinking for real users, not. Oh, well, for real users, I can update both independently of each other. Like, uh, which time minutes? Well, I guess I could show, like, um, so let's go back to this course. And it's not a concern for you at all, please. No. Like, I could change this password, and once it makes the HTTP call, it'll just return a for you saying that the password's been changed. Mm -hmm. uh, what if, in your, uh, in your views, they just look like they have, like, a ridiculous amount of logic. And then, is that, is that, were you just kind of showing off, like, oh, well, you can loop by using ng-repeat, or? Yeah, and the and answer to that is or, directives, which uh, kind of isolate um, your logic from your views, uh, kind of like uh, Brian Slap and Draper. So you, so would you use, like if you were coding this, would you use a lot of ng-repeats and stuff like that, or would you? Yeah, and I would write a bunch of custom directives. Okay. Because I, I would imagine, like, if you were, well, if you were working with a designer that um, yeah. did, didn't know Angular, they would kind of get no. And I mean, they the, just look, they're just looking at HTML and CSS. Okay. Um, and this is set up with foundation, so I did the whole change test variables to set it up. Mm. Does, does anybody else in this room done work with Angular and liked it or not liked awesome. it? We love it. We yeah. love it too. All right. No, I'm just saying. I'm saying he, he asked if anybody liked it. I, I liked it. Mm. Yeah. Great. I've been doing it fully as one app with Rails too, and I like how that's going. Right? Just yeah. an alternative way of doing it. Yeah. You, can do, you can do it as a single app, um, or as, as, a, as a single <coughs> code base, I should say. Um, Rails, Rails with the SF pipeline makes it easy for you to sort of segment out where the JavaScript code goes and where your Ruby and Rails code goes. Um, so if you want to do it as one code base maintained by one person, that's not a problem. Mm -hmm. um, however, from the standpoint of um, two people, especially if you have one person dedicated to the front end side, right. one person dedicated to the back end side, what you want is you want the, the, the separation mix talking about gives you the best mix of flexibility and, and sharing of and sharing of stuff at the same time. Yeah. I'm wondering if you've seen any like more advanced stuff for when, if you had a really big app, you probably wouldn't want to load your entire routes table and all your templates all at once. Do you know? Do you know how how bigger apps can handle? I mean, well, you can uh, zip it um, before it gets sent to the client and use the client side library to unzip it, and you can pretty much ship your entire app less than 100 kilobytes. What are you gonna say? So, so, so two two things to that. The first one is you always want to load the entire routes file. Especially if you're using um, uh, the, uh, the UI router and the state provider, because you need to have the, the, the application needs to be aware of all the states your, your routes could be in. So you need to load the whole route file, but that doesn't load the um, all of the templates and controllers. Those only get loaded when they're requested when you change into that state. So you can, so you can keep the routes file as a separate thing and load the entire routes file, and then using directives, keep all of your other stuff segregated on, such that it only gets loaded when you go into a state that requires a controller with a template that pulls in the directives that you use. And that way, that'll get you the kind of uh, sort of gradual pull down of the data. Oh, okay, so when, when Nick showed us that big HTML page he had with all these scripts in it, that didn't include all of his templates and all of this? Uh, yeah, like everything. Well, he, is he, in the, he did. He did, he did for he did for simplicity's sake. Oh, okay. But you can yeah. break all that. Stuff. You, you can, can yeah. Yeah. Alex, Alex can talk through a little bit better. But you can break all that stuff up, right? The only thing you need in, in the routes file is the structure of the routes. Mm -hmm. cool. I have one over. Uh, this might make a good uh, hack night uh, session for two hours. <laughs> This is <coughs> as as simple as Nick can make it sound, and as simple as he can move through it. Still, alive. going with something like Angular is there's no way to consider it beginner really in any way. I don't think it has to be beginner on that classroom side. Uh, True, but we but 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 most of but the majority of people come to the classroom side right. are, are fairly beginner at, in, in their stages of development. I would I wouldn't want to.